الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين وبعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome to our Friday حلقة And today uh, we are having the second segment on سورة المائدة which is سورة number 5 in the Quran And we mentioned that سورة المائدة the central theme in this سورة is about commitment to contracts and agreements And this is how it starts So the first verse in the سورة really gives a very strong statement about what the whole surah is about. يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَوْفُوا بِالْعُقُودِ All you who believe, stay true to your commitment. Fulfill your contracts. And this shows the connection between Iman, faith, that Im what faith does, it actually makes humans the best they can possibly be. It just improves our humanity. It takes our humanity to the next level. That's really what Iman does in essence. And it, it's, 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 a, it's a way of looking at what Iman really does to humans. And this is a way to sort of mention it um, so organically, naturally, without, you know, making it technical in that sense. So the whole Surah is about this and it's going to, going to show us so many shades of what commitment uh, and fulfillment of contracts mean. And we mentioned that contracts here refers to different levels of contracts and agreements. It could be as simple as our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is essentially uh, an agreement, a covenant, uh, which is already built in us, and that's our fitrah. And we said there's another level of this, and that's basically when, uh, uh, when, when a person commits to the message of Islam through the shahada, ashadu an la ilaha illallah, ashadu anna muhammad rasulullah, it is a commitment to actually live in love of Allah, in devotion of Allah, and live according to the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Other contracts, actually in, in, in a sense, all of our life is made of contracts. Every time there is some interaction with any entity, there is a contract. Either an obvious written contract, or sometimes there are more subtle, unspoken contracts, like the social contract, uh, like social norms. Uh, government agreements, citizenship, uh, even your driving license is a form of agreement. Uh, any kind of business, there is agreement. Because any interaction requires a proper definition of uh, obligations and rights and uh, everyone's territory and so on and so forth, that needs to be defined. There needs to be a mutual agreement in order for things to go as smoothly as possible and in order for rights to be preserved and for life to be functional. Otherwise, it, you know, chaos will ensue and life won't be, um, life won't, won't, won't run smooth in a sense. It won't even, you know, we won't be able to move on in life and, and function properly. We got to verse number four, I believe today, where we said Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala started explaining to the believers what is Haram for them, what is prohibited for them to eat, and we mentioned the different types like swine, uh, whatever was uh, slaughtered for other than Allah, in other than the name of Allah, uh, animals that die in certain ways, uh, and other things. And then we mentioned that Allah, how Allah made a reference to the completion of Islamic way of life, that it's complete, and that the favor of, on, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on us. Uh, have been perfected in the sense of his guidance that was given to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in verse number, number 4 says يَسْأَلُونَكَ مَاذَا أُحِلَّ لَهُمْ قُلْ أُحِلَّ لَكُمُ الطَّيِّبَاتُ وَمَا عَلَّمْتُمْ مِنَ الْجَوَارِحِ مُكَلِّبِينَ تُعَلِّمُونَهُنَّ مِمَّا عَلَّمَكُمُ اللَّهِ فَكُلُوا مِمَّا أَمْسَكْنَ عَلَيْكُمْ وَذْكُرُوا اسْمَ اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ سَرِيعُ الْحِسَابِ They ask you, so what is halal? What is permissible for us? If you just mentioned what is impermissible, what is prohibited, what is what is halal for us? So Allah responds here, He says, Say to them, Allah made halal for you everything that is good. So imagine when you look at halal and haram in Islam, because these are part, these are elements of the contract we have with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So haram is specific categories, only specific kinds that are haram, limited kinds. Whereas everything that is good is inherently halal for you. So things so the general ruling or the offset ruling of things, that's the default judgment on anything, is that it is halal. Unless there is a proof that it is not tayyib, meaning it's not good. Tayyib means good. It's of a good nature. It's of a goodly nature. 
And that shows that anything that is haram is actually not good. That's why it's not good. And this is something, this is an issue that is discussed among the scholars of Usul, um, the principles of fiqh. They say, هل الشريعة معللة أم لا? Are the rulings in Islam, do they have reasoning behind them? Do they have some logic behind them? And the strongest opinion is yes. Sometimes this logic is made explicit and sometimes it's not made so explicit. So in certain things, there are certain rulings. Why Salat al is for Raqqa? This is the ruling as to as to the number four is that's not made explicit to us. So some of this knowledge Allah kept to himself. But something like why is alcohol and intoxicants haram, impermissible? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us the reasoning behind it because it takes away your intellect. It brings about enmity among people, brings about uh, hatred among people, creates problems, right? It takes away the sense of responsibility. So because it takes away our consciousness. So, so this shows that the reason certain things are, are haram is that because they are not tayyibat, they are not good. So tayyibat, the opposite of tayyibat is khaba'ith. Khabith, khaba'ith means filth, nasty, um, impure, uh, evil. So Allah, what Allah made halal for us is actually good. And the things that he prohibited, he prohibited for a reason. A very basic reason is that they are harmful to you, either physically, in terms of dietary uh, value, uh, or they are harmful to you spiritually, or they are harmful to you in the way they manifest themselves in society. And and again, this is something like we could expand on just to talk about the nature of what you eat actually rubs off on you. And this is something Imam Al-Qayyim mentions in his book, at tabb al-Nabawi, Prophetic Medicine, is that uh, one of the reasons why Allah made eating wild animals, like prey animals, haram, is that whatever you eat, its nature sort of transfers to you. It leaks into the consumer. Um, and he mentions, Imam Al-Qayyim mentions that السباح, these are prey animals, wild animals, that eating them because of their aggressive nature and their, their beastly nature, uh, if humans eat them, it actually reflects on the demeanor of the humans over, over some period of time. And the reason Allah made pork haram is that pork displays some of the lowest type of attitudes, the most indignified attitudes towards like protection for its own like females, uh, its tendency to eat, eat its own feces and and like sort of dwell and live in in filth right so um so he says this is this is one reason why it's prohibited because he says that people keep consuming it it actually is going to reflect on their attitude towards virtue that they they won't they would stop they would have less resistance they would start to develop less resistance to a point where resistance to uh, lewd things will be removed from the human being okay so this is some kind of an expansion and that shows that everything that is made halal in islam is a tayyibat is because it's good and this is the vast majority of things that are available for consumption as long as there is no harm in it uh, then automatically it falls under halal that's the default state of it in order to say something is haram you have to establish a case for that and allah gives a detail here expounds because and he expounds with mentioning uh, an example where people could have some doubt. He says, وَمَا عَلَّمْتُم مِّنَ الْجَوَارِحِ مُكَلِّبِينَ تُعَلِّمُونَهُنَّ مِمَّا عَلَّمَكُمُ اللَّهِ And the sort of prey animals, which are the hunt animals or birds, that you train in order for them to help you in hunting, in hunt. So these animals, like some sort of falcons and some dogs, uh, that are trained to uh, help you hunt, but they would not kill with the sense or, or with the intention of eating or preying on that animal themselves. They are trained just to do that for their master. Uh, so if you train them, although these things might die before you sort of get to catch them and slaughter them properly, still it's halal for you. These are halal for you because they, this kind of, animal that works for you or that you have trained 
becomes like the knife with which you slaughter this thing and it's so some scholars say before you set off your or let loose your prey animal to catch whatever like a game you want uh, then you sort of mention the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but even though if you catch it and you just mention the name of Allah it becomes halal for you as long as this animal caught or this uh, the strained animal caught the the your the hunt or the game for that specific sake so Allah says فَكُلُوا مِمَّا أَمْسَكْنَ عَلَيْكُمْ وَذْكُرُوا اسْمَ اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ so eat from what your trained animals uh, have caught or captured for you and mention the name of Allah on it وَاتَّقُوا uh, الله. obviously again this is um, a reminder to be mindful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be thankful to Allah be dutiful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because even this there will be instances when this rule could be violated slightly and you will be tempted just to ignore this violation so in it, sometimes if your hunt hunt dog is hungry sometimes it might misbehave and it captures let's say a deer captures it for itself and a trainer, someone who's trained this dog, or who's very familiar with these dogs or, or, or falcons that, that hunt, they could tell if the falcon actually attacked the animal for it to feed to feed on it or for its own master. They can tell the signs. So sometimes you'd see the signs and you'd be tempted, no, you know, it hunted it for me, but you could see the signs that it actually hunted it for itself. So here, look at the intention of the animal. If you could tell, you could actually, uh, it counts in the ruling. So this is what Allah says, there will be, and this is this applies to every situation in life. You will find uh, situations that, are, that Allah made permissible, or you'll find concessions. People go overboard with them. People cross the limit with them. Why? Because it's easy when you are given a concession to carry it too far. So Allah says, وَاتَّقُوا You need to be mindful because the moment you start crossing the borders is the moment you're going to go too far. So, in Allah says, Allah is swift and in account or audit. And then Allah says, اليوم أحل لكم الطيبات وطعام الذين أوتوا الكتاب حل لكم وطعامكم حل لهم والمحصنات من المؤمنات والمحصنات من الذين أوتوا الكتاب من قبلكم إذا أتيتموهن إذا أتيتموهن أجورهن محصنين غير مسافحين ولا متخذي أخدان. And today the good things, all of the good things, the good foods. And even the good of clothes, whatever good, like good types of clothing, have, have been made halal for you, permissible for you. And that shows that the base rule uh, is that things are halal unless they, there is a case established that shows that this specific thing is impermissible and it's no longer good. So that's the approach. It's, many people approach Islam that everything is haram unless you prove it's halal. And that's completely against the message of the Qur'an and it shows a tendency towards extremism which is not pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by the way because sometimes people think you know being extreme uh, and, and being over strict is actually something good but it's just as bad as being lenient and some scholars indicate that it's actually even worse than being uh, lenient and then Allah says and the food of the people of the book, people of the scripture, and these are the Christians and the Jews, it's halal for you. It's made halal for you. And uh, so this is an exception. The general rule is that you cannot eat from things that are slaughtered by other than Muslims. This talks specifically about meat, about chicken, beef, etc. Um, so an exception is made here for the people of the scripture. Uh, and some scholars say because this was, because Surah Al-Ma'idah was revealed towards the later part of the life of the Prophet ﷺ. Uh, the strongest opinions indicate that it was the first parts of Surah Al-Ma'idah were revealed after Sulh Al-Hudaybiyah. Uh, when the Prophet ﷺ wanted to make Umrah, uh, year six after Hijrah, and Quraysh sort of made a big fuss out of that. Uh, then they had the agreement, the treaty that the Prophet ﷺ goes back to Medina, then he comes next year to make the Umrah. After that treaty, that agreement, it seems the first parts of Surah Al-Ma'idah were revealed. And then different parts of it were, were, reveal, were revealed in later years. So this shows that as the Muslims now are growing, it seems that the Muslims would start to have a lot of dealings with the people of the scripture. So they're going to travel, they're going to expand north uh, towards Bilad al-Sham. There is many Christians there. 
And still in Medina, there was many, there were many Jews along the way, even to towards a, a Sham towards the north in the Arabian Peninsula. There were still many Jews in Khaybar, for example. And there was also Christians in Najran to the south of you know the Arabian Peninsula, north of Yemen, these areas. Um, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is a very practical rule that Allah, and it shows that Muslims will always be, throughout history, will be in touch with the people of the scripture. There will be a lot of um, sort of uh, contact. Uh, and when you are in contact with one nation, when there is a Muslim minority in a, in a, in a, in a Christian country or a Jewish country, uh, and, and uh, not having sometimes rules, regulations, maybe there's no facilities to have the 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 proper halal meat so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it easy for the believers so this exception is made for the people of the scripture again i'm not going to take this because there's a big discussion as to is it halal for us to eat you know from these nowadays like in europe in uh, uh, north america uh, south america in australia other parts of the world uh, where can we eat from the meat that's in the market right because these are originally Christian countries. Uh, that's a big debate and a big discussion. I'm of the opinion uh, that is not as simple as just saying these are, this is meat of the people of the book. It's just not as simple as that um, for many reasons. I don't want to get into it now. So, yeah, then Allah says, وَالْمُحْصَنَاتُ مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنَاتِ وَالْمُحْصَنَاتُ مِنَ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ إِذَا أَتَيْتُمْ أُهُنَّ أُجُورَهُنْ And the chaste women, decent chaste meaning this is a woman who really looks after herself in terms of her character in terms of her reputation in terms of her conduct uh, that she's a woman who does not offer herself to other men this is a woman who preserves her chastity um, and, and femininity and her honor and dignity uh, and she's of good character she is of good character. She, so she has this character of respect, justice, devotion, uh, trustworthiness, um, and so on and so forth. So Allah says, from among the believers, meaning the Muslims, and the people of the book, Jews and Christians. So a Muslim man can marry a, 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 a Christian or a Jewish woman as long as the conditions apply and the conditions are muhsanat muhsana means a woman who does not engage in promiscuity uh, a woman who does not uh, who preserve who preserves her uh, again dresses up properly uh, and 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 decently and her whole behavior resembles muhsana muhsana is a chaste res res respectable respectful uh, decent this is a woman of, of, of very good conduct. And uh, this is an exception from the rule, the general rule. The general rule is uh, Also, So, uh, Allah SWT says, Do not marry as men, Muslim men, do not marry the non-Muslims. Here, Mushrikeen, some people say, oh, we take the literal, like, they have to be polytheists. No, Mushrikeen, Kuffar sometimes refers to just non-Muslims. It's just a word. So it refers actually to non-Muslims. So they are used interchangeably. Kafir, Mushrik uh, is used in the sense, mostly in the Quran, in the sense of uh, non-Muslim. So the general rule is that Muslims are not supposed, males or females, to marry a spouse that is a non-Muslim. That's the general rule. That is sort of the the default state. Allah here makes an exception that only Muslim men can marry Christian or Jewish women who are of such description. They're decent, honorable. They preserve themselves. They don't. They they're they're of very high uh, standard of character and so on and so forth. So some people find a loophole in this and they just wanna sort of. Uh, if they fall in love with a, with a lady and she's like, let's say she, she's a Christian or a Jew, and but not that great behavior, not that great character. Especially these days, it's very hard to, such, to find people of such, 
you know, high caliber in terms of, of characters, very high. So this is sometimes as a, a reason or a loophole for people to sort of, you know, do what they desire, use the religion for their desire. Uh, so this exception is made only for Muslim men to marry uh, Christian and Jewish women. But there is no exception that is made for Muslim women to marry a Jewish or a Christian man. This is clear cut. And there is an ijma, there is a consensus among the Muslims, among the Muslim scholars, that this is impermissible. Because the, again, the basic rule is that it's impermissible, but just one exception is made here. And any other sort of interpretation is actually, is is uh, is a motive. It's it's based on motivated reasoning. It's based on fishing for the, you know, for excuses here and there, and trying to create some kind of murkiness around the issue, and then, you know, cherry picking one's preference. When it comes to this, and Allah says, "Muhsinin aghir musafihin wa la muttakhidi akhdan." That a person, as they marry, they are supposed to be as chaste as well. So you expect to marry a chaste woman, you also are expected to be a chaste man. So it's not just and and this happens. It's very common in cultures, a lot of like Muslim background cultures, is that there is so much emphasis on the woman being chaste and and honourable. But it seems like hey, a man can get away doing what they want. But it's not the case. Uh, this chastity is actually required of everyone. It's, it's an equal obligation. So if you are going to marry, you have to honor that woman. You have to marry that contract. And again, here it fits the, con the, the context of Surah Al-Ma'idah. Is that, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَوْفُوا بِالْعُقُودِ All you who believe, stay loyal, truthful to your contract. So marriage is a very strong contract. Actually, Allah refers to it in the Quran. As Mithaqan Ghalida in Surah An Nisa, it's a very emphasized, uh, highly held contract. It's a thick contract. It's not like a, it's not a, it's not something to be taken lightly. So you are supposed to be as chaste and as honorable and as loyal as you expect that woman to be. غير مسافحين ولا متخذي أخدان not someone who's engaging in promiscuity or taking girlfriends or boyfriends etc right then Allah says ومن يكفر بالإيمان فقد حبط عمله وهو في الآخرة من الخاسرين whoever violates their iman the true faith then they will ruin their own good deeds and they will be from among the losers then here Allah talks about the wudu يا أيها الذين آمنوا إذا قمتم this is verse number six إذا قمتم إلى الصلاة فاغسلوا وجوهكم وأيديكم إلى المرافق etc. so Allah describes that before you stand up for prayer you basically do these acts wash certain parts of your of your body as wudu as the minor ablution in preparation this is this is physical purification and it parallels the spiritual preparation or spiritual cleansing that prepares you to st to be able to stand in the presence of Allah subhanahu wa who's who's tayyib who is the most pure and then, then Allah gives ex ex exemptions and that's if you are in a state of impurity after having some for example say intercourse then you have to take a shower purify you, yourself and again here are this is a contract between you and Allah but Again, contract between you and Allah, there is always the spirit of the law. Allah says, when uh, you are sick and you are unable to use water, or you are traveling, you don't have water, you don't have enough water. Uh, so what you do, Allah, and you can't use water, or you don't have enough water, then you have an alternative. Allah gave you an exemption, and that's basically, you can reach to any pure surface, earth surface, dust surface, right? And you can just sort of, touch it there's a way described in the sunnah you sort of tap on it with your palms and then uh, wipe your face with it um, and that's it Allah says ما يريد الله ليجعل عليكم من حرج ولكن يريد ليطهركم وليتم نعمته عليكم لعلكم تشكرون Allah does not want to place hardship of upon you um, at all Allah doesn't want to place hardship at all upon you but what Allah wants is to purify you to take you on this journey of purification and in order for him to complete so Allah wants you to qualify for the completion of his favor upon you for the fulfillment and the perfection of his of his favor upon you so that you may be thankful and let's compare the, let's connect this to verse number three 
So because Allah said in verse number three, اليوم أكملت لكم دينكم وأتممت عليكم نعمتي. So Allah says, I have completed my religion. I have, uh, I have completed your religion, your way of life, um, which is Islam. For you, I've completed it. Islam is complete. And then says Allah, Allah says, وَأَتْمَمْتُ عَلَيْكُمْ نِعْمَتِي And I have perfected my blessing upon you. In one interpretation, that means um, Allah completed the religion as a system, as instructions, as guidance. And the perfection of the blessing of Allah's grace upon the believers is that he made you live according to that qualify which refers specifically here to the prophet وسلم, and the best of his companions who have really lived up to that level of the completeness of islam so you have the complete guidance but you have the complete following and obedience to this and allah here praises the prophet وسلم, and the companions that you that i not only completed your religion for you, but even your practice or your adherence to it, I have perfected that for you. I've helped you reach that level. So, and this, and this verse number six actually sort of refers to this because Allah says, the reason Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes these regulations for you, how to purify yourself before salah, you make wudu, there's no wudu, you still have to do something which is tayammum. You do the tayammum. Don't think that Allah is Stipulate, stipulating these things to put hardship on you. No, the reason Allah is doing this is that these are necessary things for you. These things work accord, these things interact with your nature. They, they upgrade you as a human being. So Allah wants to purify you. Allah wants, wants to help you purify yourselves so that he perfects his grace or his blessings upon you. So Islam is complete. Allah wants to help you sort of make your adherence to Islam, make your human nature rise or match that level. And this shows the importance of Salah and the importance of uh, getting ready for Salah through Wudu. And if there's, if you can't use, use water, you, you, you do Tayyamun. This shows the high station of Salah and how important and how powerful it is. And this is why when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the believers, oftentimes you find aqamu salata wa atu zakah. They establish the prayer and they uh, give the zakah. This is the play. So the the best thing you can do to purify yourself, to elevate yourself, to increase your iman, to become a better person is salah. But this is salah that is done properly. Salah that is prayed not only physically but mentally and spiritually. It's full presence. It's a complete engagement with with the connection uh, in the connection with Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Yeah. So Allah says, don't think all of these regulations. Sometimes people might get sort of fed up with some regulations. But again, this is the impatience of the self, of the nafs. And what you need to do when you feel that is to remind, to remember that all of these things are not stipulated as a burden, but they are actually there to help you qualify, to help build you. Something similar to that is when you, for example, get involved in a competition, some kind of physical activity, some kind of a sports. And let's say you're doing basketball. You need to go through some rigid... Um, very hard, very challenging um, routine of training, maybe daily for many hours. You need to challenge yourself. You need to push yourself beyond your limits. You need to, uh, when, when you feel you have given everything you have, you push yourself even further. And somebody might say, well, why do you do that? That's way too much, right? But the thing is, when you see what's beyond it, when you see what's the outcome of this, is that when when you feel that you have given everything and then you push yourself one step further is that you actually gain so much skill because of that small step that you have taken, because of that extra mile that you have gone. You would qualify, you would sort of upgrade yourself so greatly, it would, it would pay dividends beyond, uh, I mean in a scale that is far greater than previous steps because you are reaching an area of exponential growth now even very little multiplies and 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 gives benefits far greater than maybe a hundred similar st steps at an earlier stage in the in, in on the journey 
So that's what Allah, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying. When you feel that, when this seems to you that it's, a, it's too much, don't think that Allah just wants to overburden you. Allah wants to make things difficult for you. No, but for upgrading yourself, for reaching the highest levels, for reaching a uh, star-like performance in terms of faith, iman, growth, uh, an experience, life experience, you need to qualify just like stars in any field, just like uh, heroes in any field. Gain that through grit and hard work and a lot of grinding. The same thing applies to Iman, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you a way to upgrade yourself, to reach new heights, which will just transform the quality of your life. So Allah wants, uh, wants you to match up to the perfection of Islam in your performance. So Allah is guiding you gently through that. So it's all for you. It is all for you. So don't think Allah... It's going to gain anything from that. Or Allah is trying to make things difficult. And here a verse comes to mind, which is the end of Surah Al-Furqan. Allah SWT says, ما يفعل الله بعذابكم إن شكرتم وأمنتم. Don't think that Allah wants to make things hard for you. Allah wants to punish you. Like, Allah would rather have you all believe and do the right things and just, just stay away completely from evil and that you just do the right things. You know, if, if, if things are just, if Allah... If it were completely to Allah, uh, then He would make everyone believe. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us for a test. He's, he, he said, and that's what's unique about humans, I'm going to let you choose. I, Allah says, I chose for everything in existence. I chose, I chose for it how to behave and what way of life it follows and that it worships me. But for you humans, I'm going to give you this small circle of choice where you choose what you actually do with your life. And, and, and here Allah is guiding us through that. Allah is helping us through it. So, and Allah wants us to, Allah loves that we actually succeed and that we do our best in this exam. But Allah is not going to do it for us. He, is, he, he wants us to choose it. That's the difference. Uh, yeah, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and so that he perfects his blessing upon you so that you may be thankful. You may be thankful for Islam. You may be thankful for the perfection, for the completeness of this great gift of Islam, this, this beautiful asset that you have. So that's what Allah wants to do. Then Allah says, with, uh, verse number seven, This is verse number seven. And remember the blessing of Allah and upon you, which is the deen of Islam. And your agreement with him, your contract with him, when you said we hear and we obey, you have actually made a conscious, a conscious commitment to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah says, be mindful of Allah, be careful, because Allah knows what's in, in your hearts, Allah knows what's in your chest, Allah knows what you conceal. So Allah is with you all the time. Then Allah says, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا كُونُوا قَوَّامِينَ لِلَّهِ شُهَدَاءَ بِالْقِسْطَ وَلَا يَجْرِ مَنَّكُمْ شَنْآنُوا قَوْمٍ عَلَىٰ أَلَّا تَعْدِلُوا All you who believe, stand for Allah. Be constantly in a state of standing for Allah. Meaning standing, and, and Allah here is basically, you stand for Allah because well, Allah is the truth. You stand for Allah, you stand for the rights of Allah, you stand for the truth, you stand with justice. And that's what's going to follow. شُهَدَاءَ بِالْقِسْطِ You are witnesses for justice. And here witnesses, that means you witness in your behavior, you sort of champion justice, you help justice, you, you stand with justice, you do what you can in order to establish justice. Because this this world functions on justice. It's, it's one of the very basic principles of existence and of Islam itself. And then Allah says, and do not let the hatred or the animosity you have towards a people push you towards injustice. Because I mean, again, humans have this tendency, this impulse towards injustice, they have this bias, Allah acknowledges that this exists, but what you have choice with is not whether it exists or not, because you're a human being, you have emotions, you have impulses, you have feelings, sometimes you can't control them properly, you don't have control, but what you have control too is how you respond to them, right? So Allah says, wa Be just, be fair, so this is closest to taqwa, uh, and this shows that taqwa comes from from doing the right thing uh, and uh, again fear Allah indeed Allah is aware of what you do then Allah says that he promised the believers and those who those who believe and do righteous deeds to give them forgiveness and a great reward and those who disbelieve 
and uh, lie or reject the signs of Allah, these are the people of the hellfire. And again, because the believers have stayed true to their commitment with Allah, natural commitment, fatra, human nature, whereas those who betrayed their nature, as we said last week, those who betrayed their fatra, they're actually, they're just going to end up in punishment because they've betrayed who they are. Um, then Allah reminds the believers of some of his blessings where he protected them on the day of Ahzab, the battle of the trench, how he protected them from the harm of the, the disbelievers and how Allah saved the believers. And Allah said, you should put your trust in Allah, knowing, yes, there are there is cause and effect in this world, but you know, there is much more to this world than what you see, than the cause and effect that you are aware of. So this is why you have to do what you have access to in terms of cause and effect, which is you have to do what's necessary but again you put your trust in Allah because Allah is in charge of everything then here Allah starts making a reference to the people of the scripture Allah makes a reference to the children of Israel and how uh, basically he took 12 representatives from them according to the tribes and then Allah said that I'll be with you as long as you establish the prayer give zakah and you believe in my messengers including Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu when he comes when he arrives and that you support them and you support the cause of Allah, I shall forgive your sins and allow you into paradise under which rivers flow. But whoever, so that's a covenant, that's a contract with Allah. Whoever denies or acts in denial to this, then these people have gone astray. Then Allah says, because they have violated the contract, we curse them and we made their hearts harden. So their hearts became hardened and thus they lost they lost life of the heart. They lost themselves. They lost the essence of themselves. And so they became shadows. They became mere shadows. They are absent in their life. They are absent. They live their lives absent, truly absent. They're not there in their life. And that, and that's something, inshallah, hopefully in the future we'll come to explain. Because there's two levels of life. There is the very basic animalistic level, which is physical life. But there is a higher experience of life that... That is way beyond comparison with the animalistic life. And that's life of the heart. So when the heart hardens, you know, that higher order life is blocked. And the person misses out on it. And that's paradise on earth. So Allah says, we made the hearts uh, harden. And then what that led them to, that manifested itself in the form of them uh, changing the word of Allah, changing the scripture, distorting it, mess uh, messing with it. And the, thus, they started forgetting and losing some of the divine guidance. And Allah says, you're going to see a lot of betrayal from them, except for a small minority who remain truthful. It's a minority. And these people, eventually, when they came to Islam, they actually embraced Islam. Like, for example, Ubay ibn Ka'b, uh, Abdullah ibn Salam, and others. فَعْفُ عَنْهُمْ وَصْفَحْ Allah says... Um, you know, forgive their mistakes, overlook their their betrayals for now. Indeed, Allah loves those who actually do good, do extra good, right? Then Allah makes a reference to the Christians that we have this verse number fourteen that we had a covenant with them, so they forgot some of it. They left so because nasiya in the Arabic language could mean forget and could mean neglect both of, both of them. So they neglected some of what they were reminded with, some of their scriptures. So thus we brought about enmity amongst them. And you will find this among the Christian denominations. There's always been, you know, enmity, uh, struggle among them. You find for a long time, it's been the, between the Eastern and the Western Roman empires, you'll find Rome and Constantinople, the Orthodox and the Catholic, and then later on the Protestants, then the Angelica. So you'll find these denominations there will be times of peace, there will be time, times of cooperation, but there will be a lot of uh, enmity amongst them. And that's what the Quran basically says. And, and it's something that came because they split over the scripture. They did not stay truthful to their scripture in that sense. Um, and, and we know from, from history that when the, when, the, when the Muslims, when the Ottomans were, took over Constantinople, many of the residents of those lands, of the Christians, Orthodox Christians, actually preferred the Muslims to take over rather than the, the Rome itself, the Catholics, sort of taking over. Because Constantinople, but by that time, uh, or the Eastern Roman Empire by that time, Byzant uh, Byzantium, 
uh, grew very, very weak. So it was only Constantinople. For, for the rest of it, it really lost a lot. Um, uh, it was so weak that it was left with no option except to uh, seek the help of its uh, long-standing enemy in Rome, the Catholics, in order to be able to protect themselves against the Ottomans, against the Muslims at the time. Uh, but many of them actually, many of the population actually preferred to live under the Muslims than live under the 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 Catholics. There was there was there were many bloody wars, you know, between them. Anyways, okay. So then Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, verse number fifteen says, "O people of the book, our messenger has come to you, clarifying many issues to you, many things in your scriptures that were unsettled. He brought the final word to them, and he would leave a lot of the things." Uh, that you have changed about your scripture, that he would leave them because it's not, you don't want to get lost in the details here, right? So he's just corrects as, as much as necessary. He brings things to conclusion as much as necessary. Uh, then he says, uh, What has come to you is uh, light from Allah and uh, a clear book or a clarifying book, a book that is clear in itself and that clarifies and explains the truth very plainly. Uh, beautiful description of the book of Allah and of the guidance of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu that Allah guides through this book, through this scripture, through this revelation that was given to, given to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, whoever follows the, the, what Allah is pleased with, whatever follows the guidance of this, of this scripture, of this book, the Quran here, Allah would guide them to the ways of peace, to the, to the uh, roads to peace. And Allah would save them from the darkness into the light with his own permission and would guide them to the straight path. And it shows that anyone who holds on to the Qur'an, remains truthful to the Qur'an and open to the message of the Qur'an without having to read into it, they would actually be guided. That's a promise by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then Allah goes on to clarify more how the people of the scripture did not remain truthful to their contracts with Allah. Where Allah says, لَقَدْ كَفَرَ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا إِنَّ اللَّهَ هُوَ الْمَسِيحُ بْنُ مَرْيَمُ Indeed, the people who said or who claimed that, uh, that Allah is the Messiah, uh, son of Mary so that anyone who claims that Jesus is the son uh, is Allah he's himself Allah he's God then these people have committed a blasphemy a disbelief an act that violates faith and annihilates and, and, and annuls it completely so um, yeah so it's, it's, it's the biggest violation because your violation the very cornerstone of what revelation is basically and what the relationship between us and Allah is your your you're, you're making a false claim on the very nature of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, that, is, that is opposite to what he really is. Okay, so then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clarifies this and Allah clarifies or responds to some of their, prob some of their claims where they said that uh, and the Jews and the Christians, they said we are the children of Allah and we are the ones that he loves. Uh, Allah responds to how, how you deal with that and how you logically sort of uh, you know, expose this, this kind of untrue claim uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what he wants from humans is that for them to remain truthful and to follow the truth. That's the affiliation we have with Allah. There is no blood relationship. There is no favoritism. It's as the Prophet sallallahu says, لا فضل لعربين على عجمين ولا لعجمين على عربي إلا بالتقوى. There is no favor, no merit for anyone, no excellence, no like... Uh, standing for anyone over another person, whether Arab to non-Arab, uh, white to black, black to white, etc., any color, except with taqwa. That's the only criterion with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So titles, names, affiliations, that's, these are just, they're just categories you create. These are just names and words you create. It's about the reality of your relationship with Allah, your relationship with the truth and your adherence to it. Um, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions a story, and I'm going to close with this, uh, which is Allah shows the violation of the followers, some of the followers of Prophet Musa, Moses, alayhi salam, how when he said uh, to them, 
uh, remember the blessing of Allah because blessings of Allah shows that there is a commitment when someone is kind to you you have a commitment unspoken commitment to you this is a social contract this is a natural contract we have someone has been honest with you someone's been kind to you you're expected to be kind to them in return it's just it's it's normal it it doesn't need to be spoken it's understood and if someone is not does not respond this reciprocity if someone does not respond then there is something wrong with them so Allah, he says, remember the blessings of Allah upon you that he sent you guidance through prophets, messengers, and Allah made you kings. Allah made you dominant over the earth. Kings, Musa alayhi salam was given so much power. Dawood alayhi salam was given so much power. Sulaiman alayhi salam, these were kings. Um, Allah gave you what he didn't give other humans. He gave you so many merits. He said, Enter the sacred land, which is al, al, the, the, in Pal Palestine. Enter the sacred land uh, that Allah wrote for you, prescribed for you, and do not run away. Do not turn back on your heels. So, otherwise, lest you be, you lose. They said, "Oh, there are very powerful, mighty people in this in this land, and we're not going to go there. If they leave, we will go." Right? Although they are promised victory. So then two from the believers among them, and some narrations indicate that this was actually Musa alayhi salam and Harun, they said uh, that if you just enter through the gate, Allah will give you victory over them. It's very simple, like you sort of guaranteed victory. You just have to cross, or you have to march through your fear. You have to go through your fear. You might experience a little bit of loss at the beginning, but that's just inevitable. But you are guaranteed victory as long as you break into the gate and put your trust in Allah. They eventually would look at the response they said, and that shows you that like favors and blessings don't even do not pay off with these people. Like they're, they're not truthful, they're not responsive positively to these blessings. Uh, uh, they said, O oh Musa, we will not uh, enter it as long as these people are in it. Forget about that. If you want, you go with your Lord and fight. We are here. We're going to sit here and we're going to watch. You go and fight with your Lord. So here, uh, Musa alayhi salam turns to Allah. He says, Oh Allah, inni la amliku illa nafsi wa akhi. Oh Allah, the only ones I have control over, the only ones I can bring to obey your command to enter this city is myself and my brother Harun. So make a judgment between us and these rebellious people. Allah says, فَإِنَّهَا مُحَرَّمَةٌ عَلَيْهِمْ أَرْبَعِينَ سَلَامٌ We're going to prohibit them from entering it. They're going to stay in a diaspora. They're going to be lost in the land for 40 years. And do not feel bad. Do not have any pity towards those rebellious people. Compare this to the response of the companions عنهم, before the Battle of Badr because the Prophet set off Medina to capture the caravan which again was making business trade using the assets that were confiscated of the people who had migrated from Mecca to Medina. So the Prophet ﷺ set off to capture it. Yet Abu Sufyan managed to escape. Quraysh put together an army. The Muslims were had only their basic weapons, sword, each one had their own sword. That's it, maybe a little bit of archery. Um, uh, and and Quraysh brought a fully equipped army with, with about a thousand people. The Muslims were greatly outnumbered. Then the news reached the Prophet ﷺ that the caravan escaped, Quraysh brought an army, what are you going to do? So the Muslims had to make a very difficult choice, tough choice. Now they are camping, they're ready, they were ready to fight or capture the caravan, but they were not ready for a full-fledged battle. But now they have to face, if they withdraw to Medina, it's already a loss. It's a very bad reputation for Muslims and that army might actually march to Medina, the army of Quraysh. So very, very risky decision. Or let's actually fight this army, completely outnumbered, no proper equipment, we don't have our arms properly, so what are we going to do? The Prophet ﷺ wanted to march forward and face that army, put his trust in Allah. Um, obviously the Muhajireen were committed, but the Prophet ﷺ says, what do you think, O Muslims? They said, we're going to do this? Yeah, we, we are with you, do whatever you want. Then the Prophet ﷺ again said, what do you think? Ashiru aliyya ayyuhal qawm. What's your consultation? Then, I think it was Sa'd ibn Mu'ad. Sa'd ibn Ubaid, Sa'd ibn Mu'ad, I believe. He said, Ya Rasulullah, ka'annaka ta'anina. O Messenger of Allah, it seems like you want us to talk. We, the Ansar, the people of Medina. 
Because the agreement between the Prophet ﷺ and the Ansar is that to protect the, Mus the Prophet ﷺ in Medina. There was no mention of outside of Medina because it did not even occur to them. So the Prophet ﷺ said, yes. Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad said, O Messenger of Allah, we have promised to protect you just as we protect our own families, our own selves. And then he said, O Messenger of Allah, even if, if you cross the ocean, we're going to cross it with you. And the ocean for the Arabs was such a tough thing, by the way. Like, if you go into the unknown, we're just going to jump behind you. Regardless, we don't know what's going to happen. But we're just going to, we, we are committed. Again, that's a sense of commitment, right? Then he says, we will not say to you like the Bani Israel, like the children of Israel said to Musa, Idhab anta wa rabbuka faqatila inna ha huna qa'idun. We're not going to say like those people said to Musa, that you go and fight with your Lord, we're going to sit here and watch. But what we say to you, you fight with your Lord, obviously with the help of your Lord, we are with you. We're going to fight. We're going to fight with you. We're going to defend the truth with you. And the Prophet ﷺ felt very, very happy. He was very happy with that response from Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad. And this shows maybe this story was actually revealed earlier. At the time, we're talking about the time of the Battle of Badr, which is the second year after Hijrah. Okay, so I think it's... Uh, Good place to stop here by verse number 26. Jazakumullah uh, khairan for joining us. Inshallah, hope to see you next Friday. Uh, next Friday is going to be Eid, Eid al Adha. And again, just a reminder to uh, do as many good deeds as possible in the best quality that you can and uh, fast some of the days, and specifically the day of Arafah, which is going to be uh, next Thursday. This upcoming Thursday, and uh, and uh, don't forget to do dhikr. Dhikr. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. La ilaha illallah. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Walillahi alhamd. Do it loud at home, uh, in the street if it's if you feel it's appropriate. In your car as you're driving when you're having your morning walk. Um, just it's it's a great sunnah to do something Allah Subhanahu wa Taala loves to be done. جزاكم الله خيرا وصلى الله وسلم على سيدنا محمد وآله وصحبه وسلم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله